Welcome everyone. I am Dr. Asma Naeem, the Eddy C, and C. Sylvia Brown, Chief Curator here at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Welcome to the first event for the BMA community for 2022. Tonight, we are thrilled to have some esteemed guests to discuss a wonderful new portrait on display here at the museum. Back in March of 2021, Dr. Maya Rockmore Cummings commissioned the official portrait of her late husband, Congressman Elijah E. Cummings. You'll be hearing about that selection process shortly, but spoiler alert, Baltimore-based artist Jarrell Gibbs was chosen for the commission. We are pleased that the portrait is making its debut at the Baltimore Museum of Art and is on view for the wider community through January 9th, so four more days, before its permanent installation in the U.S. Capitol. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be sharing this national treasure here in Congressman Cummings' hometown before it moves to the Capitol. Tonight, Jarrell will be in conversation with the Baltimore Museum of Art's Dorothy Wagner Wallace Director, Christopher Bedford. Maya will be moderating this discussion. A few housekeeping items. There will be a question and answer session at the end of this talk. Viewers are welcome to enter their questions in the comments throughout the talk. And we will also try to answer as many questions as we can during the question and answer period. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Maya Akamore Cummings. Dr. Cummings is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Metro and the founder, president, and CEO of Global Policy Solutions. A wealth, health, and education equity expert, she has conducted extensive research and policy analysis on aging, social security, the social determinants of health, and racial wealth and achievement gaps. Her forthcoming book, Rageism, Racism, Ageism, and the Quest for Liberation Policy to be published by Routledge will be coming out later this year. Thanks again for joining us this evening. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Cummings to begin this discussion. Thank you so much, Asma. You know, there are so few opportunities in life where everything feels like they just fall into place just perfectly, but this opportunity the opportunity for the commission of Elijah Cummings' official portrait was one of those uh, situations where everything from beginning to end just fell into place just perfectly. And it's because in many respects of the Baltimore Museum of Art and their leadership uh, to help process and bring this uh, painting and portrait to fruition. When I got a call from the uh, House Committee on uh, Government Oversight and Reform in December of 2000, uh, actually well, it was 2020 uh, when I received it, I was just like, okay, they said, you, you're gonna have to do a portrait for Elijah and you're gonna have to lead the process. And I really didn't know uh, where to turn. And even though I'd uh, served on the board of the Baltimore Museum of Art, it wasn't my first thought. And after talking to a few people, um, it was determined that, you know, this would be a possibility. And so it was my distinct honor and privilege to work with several board members uh, like David Warnock uh, and certainly uh, Amy uh, to basically uh, turn and talk to the folks at the Baltimore Museum of Art to do this. And so I'm very grateful for Chris Bedford and his entire team including uh, Asma and Carlin and Alexa and the entire communications team and the public outreach team for all of the work that they did to bring this to fruition. Uh, and of course, none of this would have happened without the special support uh, from the donors and friends uh, that supported uh, the commission project. And those donors include, you know, certainly very uh, important people in Elijah and my life. Uh, many people know that Elijah and I got married uh, in 2008, and I moved to Baltimore without knowing a, many people at all. And in the course of our social life, we were able to meet some wonderful, wonderful people. And many of those people were the same people uh, who decided to su support the commission. And so it is my distinct honor and privilege to share with you 
uh, the sponsors of this portrait. Uh, the generous sponsorship of the commission portrait uh, included Nancy Dorman and Stanley Mazaroff. Uh, thank you, Nancy and Stan, for your generosity. Robert Meyerhoff and Rita Becker, uh, dear friends uh, that we met in 2008. Thank you, Robert and Rita. Under Armour Foundation and Kevin Plank, certainly, uh, you know, certainly dear friends uh, to Elijah and I throughout the years. Bloomberg Philanthropy, uh, while Michael Bloomberg is not of sort necessarily from Baltimore, he is a friend of Baltimore and certainly of Johns Hopkins. Uh, the Shelter Foundation and the Pearlstone Family Fund, uh, they certainly have leaders, stellar leaders who are friends of ours and whom we love dearly and thank for supporting this effort. Lisa Harris Jones and Sean Malone, thank you so much for your support. And certainly Michelle Speaks and David Warnock from whom uh, I received the inspiration to actually turn to the Baltimore Museum of Art. And so thank you, Michelle and David, for your tremendous support. Uh, we also wanna thank uh, the donors who um, support the presentation of the portrait in the Baltimore Museum of Art. And if you have not been yet, I, I urge you to see it. It's a gorgeous display. Uh, and certainly uh, it hangs in a lovely, uh, lovely area of the Baltimore Museum of Art that you must see. But the Stone Ridge Fund of Amy and Mark Meadows uh, supported that as well as the Pearl Stone Family Fund. Claire Zamowski Siegel, uh, the chair of the board of the Baltimore Museum of Art, whom I almost, uh, also must thank for her support. Again, Michelle Speaks and David Warnock. So thank you so much to these supporters uh, for making this portrait possible. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we will talk about the process of how the portrait got made, but it could not have happened without the generous donation of time uh, and energy uh, of our stellar, uh, certainly committee, selection committee. Uh, who were comprised of, you know, a, basically a virtual who's who of those in the art world in Baltimore City, certainly community-based, uh, as well as those who represent formal institutions. So with that, again, I want to thank Christopher Bedford of the Baltimore Museum of Art, Jeffrey Kent, uh, and certainly Lori Johnson, Lisa Harris-Jones, Amy Frankel Meadows, as Naeem, Carlin Thomas, Troy Staten, and Kwame Webb. Thank you so much for sharing your time and certainly your energy. Now, it is my distinct honor and privilege today to get this conversation kicked off right. There is a gentleman that I have worked with since 2019 that I just think so highly of. Uh, I was able to serve on the board of the Baltimore Museum of Art, excuse me, from 2017 to 2019. And, and in that time, I witnessed the stellar leadership of Christopher Bedford, uh, who was a tremendous uh, leader and continues to be a tremendous leader of the Baltimore Museum of Art. He is the Dorothy Wallace Wagner, uh, director of the Baltimore Museum of Art. And in the time that I worked with him, I saw his integrity, I saw his passion, I saw his understanding of the gaps that lie in the basically in the art world and his desire to close that gap, um, those gaps by focusing on equity in the art world and basically opening up uh, certainly opportunities for more people of diverse backgrounds and more artists of diverse backgrounds. And so with that, it is my distinct honor and privilege uh, to welcome Christopher Bedford to the conversation. We know he and his team work very hard. And so Chris, I'd like to kick it off by asking you, why did you agree to accept to do this? It was a hard slog uh, to bring this process to fruition. So if you could tell us why you agreed to do this and what the process was, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Thank you, Maya. Um, so I think, first of all, I'm not gonna reiterate every thank you that Maya so eloquently um, shared with us. But I do want to thank you, Maya, from everybody involved in this process, all of the funders, um, all of the BMA staff so intimately involved in this. Uh, I think I can speak for Jarrell. I can speak for the other two artists who were finalists too in saying that you, you're the inspiration for the work that we did. And uh, when, when, you, when you ask, why in the world I would agree to such a long process. I would first say you're incredibly persuasive, um, but in this case, it involved no persuasion whatsoever. 
Um, and then I think more meaningfully and perhaps more emotionally, I will say there is no public figure who better embodies the mission and vision of the BMA than Elijah Cummings. So it seemed to me self-evident that we would be uh, deeply engaged in this process. And before I discuss that a little bit, I did want to share with you one very brief personal anecdote. So when I arrived in Baltimore, maybe five and a half years ago, one of the first public outings I was involved in was a benefit at the School for the Arts. And Maya, I'm sure you were there. Um, I had the honor of sitting at the table with the, with the Josephs, um, great supporters of the BMA and great supporters of the Baltimore, uh, the School for the Arts as well. And we were you know, going through the, the usual course of a gala, comments were being made, um, toasts were being made, food was being partially consumed. And um, Elijah Cummings was invited to, to give comments. And of course, I knew of him, his reputation, um, had seen him on television. Um, but to see him stand up impromptu in front of 500 people, command everybody's attention, command everybody's emotion, and in the course of three minutes, focus everybody on the purpose of that gala, reduce many of us to tears, and, 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 and generate the um, a completely, I think, inevitable standing ovation, um, was one of my most memorable Baltimore experiences. And I think it was a sense of being in the presence of a true civil rights leader. And I didn't think that I would have that experience in my lifetime that always struck me as a historical phenomenon. So, so when we, you approached us about the possibility of partnering on this commission, it seemed to me really apparent that we needed to capture that spirit and paint. And that is a tall order to say the very least. And it also seemed very apparent to me that we needed to work with an emerging Baltimore based and trained talent because that's precisely what Elijah would have wanted. And um, as, as Asma said, spoiler alert, we have uh, Jarrell Gibbs right here with us. And everybody knows as a consequence of the glowing coverage in the New York Times, um, the Baltimore Sun and elsewhere who won that commission. But I did want to just briefly step us through the process. Um, art museums are like aircraft carriers. We move incredibly slowly and we love our slowness. Um, we're deliberate, we're intentional, and this process was exactly that. Um, I believe my approach this in March of 2021, and we did not make the announcement until December of 2021. Um, so it was a, a searching and I think deliberate, intentional, and rigorous process that gives us all a great deal of comfort in the way that we went about this work. So we're very fortunate at the museum to have a strong and varied um, uh, diverse in every sense curatorial department, deeply embedded in the Baltimore art world. So it was obvious to us, to the committee, that we had to first go to those contemporary curators and ask who they might recommend. So I believe that we were directed towards about 30 Baltimore-based or Baltimore-trained or Baltimore-adjacent painters. And from that list of 30 really extraordinary practitioners, which I think attest to the depth and wealth of um, artistic practice in this city, we were able through lots and lots of deliberation among our committee. And if anybody's familiar with our committee, everybody has an opinion as they should. And everybody was liberal in sharing that opinion, myself included. We were able to land on three great artists, Ernest Shaw, uh, Monica Ekebwu, and of course, Jarrell, the eventual winner. So having moved through um, that whittling, we decided that the best next step was to do studio visits. And given the quality of the artist's work, um, it should come as no surprise that every single studio visit was overwhelming in its depth and its breadth. And I think we were variously convinced and variously charmed by each of the artists. And um, as is often the case when you're working in the context of a committee of people who have very strong opinions, we left with absolutely no firm opinion whatsoever. It was an exercise in relativism with everybody um, accruing different and unexpected merits, which was you know, a great pleasure. And I think when you have um, an experience of art history in the present that yields such fruit, it reminds you why we do the work that we do. So um, <clears throat> having done those studio visits and gotten to know the artists and having reached a point of complete and utter indecision, it was in fact Maya who had the inspired and I think slightly unorthodox idea of asking each one of the three finalists to produce a sketch. And um, from those sketches, we were then to 
you know, reach a decision, daunting task as it was, as to who we wanted to um, perform the work of capturing Elijah's likeness in the official portrait that was to be held in the Capitol in perpetuity. So daunting task, and I think entirely correct to um, elect to take this, this extra step. So I think that is cue for the slide. Um, knowing that this was a little bit unusual on our part, we did also make the concurrent decision to pay what each one of the artists for their work in producing um, a sketch capturing Elijah's likeness and his spirit um, in their chosen material. And we also committed to add a work, add that work uh, to the BMA's collection as a part of this process to honor their work and also to memorialize that process in our permanent collection, which I think is enormously, enormously important. Um, I think it's very notable that, that when, we, when we made that decision to buy a work by Ernest and buy a work by Monica, those were the first two works by those artists to enter the collection and probably surely the first in a number in the coming years. So I'm just showing you here Ernest Shaw's watercolor and paper rendering um, of the con. It's titled The Crossroads One. Um, brought into the collection via the Alice and Frank and Cooley Fund and um, now resident in our brand spanking new vaults at the BMA. So extremely exciting. And then the next slide, please. I want to draw just attention to Monica's work titled here, Representative Charcoal and Paper. Um, any student of media knows exactly how dexterous um, it, it, she would have to be to capture Elijah's likeness on that scale using charcoal and paper. And this work was every bit as dazzling in person, every bit as sensitive in person as it appears to be um, on your screen at the moment. And then of course there was Jarrell's contribution um, captured here, uh, also now a part of our collection, um, attesting to, the, to this process and to the other competitors in that process. And so, of course, as you can see from the three finalists, it was a long and um, difficult discussion that eventually led us to um, Jarrell as the recipient of the official commission, which in turn led him to um, the core of his work, which is producing the portrait itself. And um, I'm showing you here a photograph um, taken at the BA of the portrait without its frame. And then the next slide, please. An image of the congressman's likeness installed in all its majesty in the center of our American wing, um, newly and properly framed and available to our audience until January 9th. And um, I think Jarrell speaks about this dimension of his work more eloquently than anybody else. But there is, there is an operation that's performed on the eye and on the heart and on the mind by these paintings that is very difficult to capture um, in a video or in a photograph. So I would really strongly encourage everybody to come to the museum in the next four days to have an experience of communion with this extraordinary um, portrait. Then finally, before I stop droning on, I did want to point out that we have two other works by Jarrell in our collection and uh, tip my hat here Michael Sherman and his wife, uh, Carrie, who are great, great supporters of this museum. Um, Michael Sherman is a trustee, and it was through his generosity that we were able to bring this first double portrait into the collection, which we showed in 2021. And then the next slide, please. One other that is currently on view in the contemporary wing. So Jarrell has the, has the honor of being represented by two paintings in the BMA at present. This one is called For Thomas and it was brought into the collection um, through a fund created in part by the Pearlstone Family Foundation, who also helped fund, of course, the creation of Jarrell's portrait of uh, Elijah E. Cummings. So um, that is how we landed at Jarrell. And fortunately for everybody present, we have Jarrell um, with us on this Zoom. So I think it's back over to you, Maya, for a second. So Jarrell, I think, the, this back over to you. You've been in the New York Times, you've been covered in the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, literally this has been all over Baltimore Magazine. I just read an interview with you today on. How do you feel? <laughs> Overwhelmed, overjoyed, um, grateful, blessed, um, thankful, um, excited. I mean, I could go on for the rest of the night. <laughs> 
So, you know, for a lot of people, they're just now being introduced to you. I mean, literally, your portrait of Elijah was carried and shown in the New York Times and in the Baltimore Sun. Uh, and people were wanting to know who is Jarrell Gibbs. So, you know, for those people who are just being introduced to your work, uh, what do you want them to know about who you are, why you do what you do, and how you do it? Yeah, um, first and foremost, um, I'm a God fearing man. Um, I'm a husband and um, I'm a father and obviously a painter, um, but also I consider myself an artist as well. And it's something that I'm interested in exploring a little more deeply. Um, I would have to say those are the like most important things that I would, you know, really focus on. Um, so it's interesting to me that you actually said you were an artist last. And yes. so I actually want to probe this because for me, I've got to tell you, I've read your story several times now, and it usually starts with one day you were at work as an adult, you were painting, uh, and then you sent the paint, you were uh, drawing, excuse me, um, doodling, and you sent your doodle to your wife, and your wife said it was fantastic, and she got you some uh, painting materials, and then off you were. Uh, the next thing you would know, you were a MICA graduate and then you started painting professionally. But did you know as a kid, did you know that you were talented? You know what? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I used to draw a lot as a kid. Um, what I did know when I was a kid was I drew better than a lot of <laughs> people my age at the time. I'll say that. And, you know, it's not about me being... Um, arrogant or anything. It's simply I noticed that what I was creating at a younger age wasn't um, similar to what I was seeing from others around my age. And did you um, have encouragement? Not necessarily. And I think it was uh, simply, simply because um, the concerns of my family at that time was less about uh, <laughs> me creating art. Um, it was less about uh, the gifts that I had in that space because it was a it was an unknown space, um, especially where I'm coming from. You know, it's it's unknown. It's unknown territory. Um, there's no how do you say this? There's no understanding of what art can do for you at that time in that space around you know where we were in our lives. Um, so no, it wasn't a huge investment in it. Um, but that's nothing against my family. That's just a lack of us knowing at the time. Well, it wasn't necessarily even family, school, school, uh, teachers or anything like that. But I got to tell you, I empathize because my dad had artists, uh, artistic talent. And then my brother and I uh, were both award winning artists in middle school and high school. Uh, yet my parents constantly said, you cannot major in basket weaving when you go to college. Mm -hmm. And neither one of us uh, actually ended up exploring uh, our artistic sides. Um, so, you know, I completely empathize with you on that. So Jarrell, you were, um, you know, you lived in Baltimore, in and around Baltimore all of your life. Can you tell us how Baltimore itself influenced you as an artist and, and how you actually came at this commission of Congressman Elijah Cummings, who was also a native born Baltimore son? Yeah, um, Baltimore is everything. Baltimore is uh, the thread of everything that I do. Um, my family's from here, again, born and raised here in Baltimore. Um, lived here all my life. Uh, went to school here, went to graduate school here. Um, had my family here, you know, like, so everything that I, everything that I put into my work is centered around Baltimore for the most part. It stems from Baltimore. The photos that I use as source material, they come from photo album, family photo albums, um, which were taken here in Baltimore, which are from family that lives here in Baltimore. Um, so again, it's like the thread. It's a part of everything that I do, everything that I incorporate into my work. And I think um, that was significant as it related to the painting, uh, creating the um, Honorable Elijah uh, Cummings portrait was the importance and the fact that he was from here as well. So I felt like there was energy and um there were stories and there was just experiences that you get from growing up here in baltimore city and just living in baltimore that were able to uh be a part and kind of be infused in the painting 
because of those similar, uh, similar characteristics that we have from where we come. Right. So I've got to tell you, when you get on the painting, you basically, it's incredible. If you have not seen it before it leaves Baltimore, you absolutely must go see it. And you get up on it and you just see strokes and then you back up and then you see a person, you back up a little bit more and you know it's Elijah Cummings. It's not just Elijah Cummings image. It is the essence of Elijah. And so that is artistic talent. Chris, I mean, I got it mixed up. I think in the, in the process of our process, I called it uh, Afro-impressionism. Uh, but your team corrected me and said it's Afro-expressionism. For those of us who don't know the difference between impressionism and expressionism, can you share with us what the difference is and why Jarrell's work is an exemplar mm -hmm. of the latter category? I can, I can certainly try, and I'm not going to bore everybody with a lecture in art history, but I, what I will say, and I, I, I saw some of your questions in advance, and I think this is a sophisticated one that requires a little bit of, sort of reflection and thought, particularly because both of those movements are rooted in <clears throat> traditions that arose in Europe during the 20th century. So, you know, Impressionism um, rooted in the French tradition, I associate Expressionism most directly with German artists, particularly working before and after or in the war years. And I think, and particularly in listening to Jarrell speak, that emphasis on the specificity of a lived life, um, your desire to identify yourself versus a God-fearing man, as a father and as a husband, that proximity between artistic practice or seamlessness between artistic practice and lived experience, to me is something that differentiates expressionism as a historical phenomenon from the more optically focused impressionist movement. So that had a lot more to do with, I think, formal innovation, light effects, the capacity of paint to capture the observed world, whether a person or a landscape. I think in the case of expressionism, it has a lot more to do with interior life and society. Um, particularly in the hands of German artists who were dealing with the trauma of war and the need to capture that trauma in physical likeness. And I think Jarrell deals with a, a lot of that in his work. There's a, a quietness and a softness and a melancholy to a lot of those portraits, um, really, really deeply felt. Um, and I think they're equal parts paint, and I think you got to this, Maya. That experience of being very close to the surface, and it's as if the painting is taking itself apart. And then as you move further back, it materializes. And then eventually you're in the presence of the spirit of the thing, which is very different than the materiality of the thing. So to me, this is, I know, a long and um, circuitous answer, but I think it's that, that issue of capturing feeling, um, interior life and registering society's forces um, in an image as opposed to a simple formal experiment. And that to me is far more expressionistic than impressionistic. So that, that gives me a better sense because Darrell, I gotta tell you, I gave all of the um, selected finalists an opportunity to call me and ask me and talk to me about Elijah. Two of the three artists did and Jarrell was one of them. And Jarrell, I was just like, why are you asking me about what Elijah likes and you know his favorite this and his favorite that? Uh, why did you ask me these personal questions uh, before making the portrait? And how does that go into, how does knowledge of these personal perspectives go into the making of the portrait? So um, quick fact, quick that most may, most may not know. Um, while I was in graduate school, my concentration was humanistic studies. Yeah. So I'm really interested in people, always have been. I uh, can pick up on people's cues. Like I'm really good with people. Um, and I'm always interested in people. I'm interested in finding ways to build bridges for communication, being um, exposing people to different spaces, different ideas, like I've always been interested in that. Um, but the questions that I asked you specifically um, in order to create the painting were just so I can get to know who he was. I didn't know him personally, unfortunately. And in order to create a painting of that magnitude, at least for me, I need to really know who, I, who I'm painting. You know, I need to research as much as I can. I need to watch as many videos as I can. I need to read, uh, to, to listen as much as I can to the person. Um, I need to read it. 
I need to do, I basically need to almost become the person in order to convey what it is that they are, you know, through the use of paint. Um, so that's what I was about. It was really about getting to know uh, Elijah Cummings on a personal level um, and really allowing the personal side of Elijah Cummings to influence the work. Well, I just want you to know that um, I've had the opportunity to work with two artists on Elijah projects in the last two years. One was you, and the other one was the great thespian Lawrence Fishburne, also an award-winning artist. And he asked me similar questions that you did <laughs> <laughs> because he did the audio book for Elijah's book. And at the time I was just like, okay, you're reading an audio book. Why do you need to know what his favorite songs are? Why do you need to know if he was left-handed or right-handed? You did the same thing without even knowing it. Wow. I just want you to know that. Thank you. So then, um, you know, the famous, the infamous background, I've got to bring this up. Because <laughs> when we selected you as the artist, there were flags behind Elijah. There was a desk over to the side. There was this grand, fabulous lion. Um, and, you know, I asked you why you selected a lion and you said because it reflected the, the you know, the, the spirit and the essence of Elijah in terms of how he roared in the hearing room, but also how he had a quiet, majestic presence uh, when he was uh, silent. And I thought that was so, so powerful. And then when I saw the final picture, all of it was gone. What happened? What happened? Well, um... Over time, I started to realize that a lot of the, a lot of the extra items, the components of the painting that I included, really wasn't necessary. You know, uh, what I realized about what I've learned about Elijah Cummings over uh, the past what six or seven months was he could hold his own. You know, in any space at any time, it didn't matter. And all of those other um, attributes and everything else that I was that I was putting into the painting at the beginning weren't necessary. It just took away from who he was. And um, I really wanted the viewer to focus on him. Um, and that put me in a space of wanting to go back to think about the way that like royalty was painted, thinking about the way that paintings were created way before I was here. And um, Rembrandt kept coming in my mind. And um, what I really loved about the paintings that Rembrandt, the portraits um, that Rembrandt did was just the subtlety, the subtlety in the way that the painting was created, the, the use of light to really create like energy and aura around the figure. Um, and just his focus on like the details that were really important and kind of letting everything else fall to the wayside. And, um, you know, my wife and actually like my older people that I really listen to, like my mentors, they've always told me that less is more, you know, and um, thinking about that, I really just pondered on it. And, and it made perfect sense that I need to focus on exactly who Elijah Cummings was, to portray him in a manner that he deserved to be portrayed and to uh, not focus on everything else because it wasn't about all of that other stuff. Well, I want to thank you for that because I definitely think it's a majestic portrait and Elijah was majestic, but I got to tell you this, that, you know, I used to, I met Elijah on the Hill. I used to work on Capitol Hill. I've been to several portrait unveilings on Capitol Hill. I've seen all of the portraits in most of the committees I've ever been in. All of them have flags. And so <laughs> I was just like, oh God, there's no flag. <laughs> and then I had lunch with Nancy uh, Dorman and Nancy was like, where's the flags? <laughs> I said, well, you think I should go back and ask you to add the flags? And I think I approached you and you're like, no. Nope. <laughs> and actually, I am so glad that you said no. And this is why. Because I began to reflect on the empty space behind Elijah and realize it wasn't empty. Um, there is an aura there, which is very important. You mentioned that word. But also, as I really began to ponder the image, Elijah is wearing red, white, and blue. And when you think about our democracy, it's not a piece of cloth with some colors on it and some symbols. It really is each one of us who represents. And I think you captured that to perfection in this piece. And so I just wanna thank you for ignoring me. Uh, thank you for saying no, uh, because I do think uh, the piece is just absolutely exquisite and I do consider it a masterpiece. 
And so with that, Chris, you know, I have, I posted it on LinkedIn. I posted it on Instagram. I posted it on Facebook. I posted it on uh, Twitter. I've gotten hundreds of thousands of hits, uh, you know, in terms of Legends Portrait, everybody seems to love it. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure that millions more people have seen it on the New York Times and the other publications it's run on. There is a deep interest uh, in this portrait. And, and so can you tell us, Chris, I mean, what makes it a compelling portrait in the eyes of the art world? <laughs> and again, another enormous question. Um, so I'm not sure I can, I, I can sort of talk myself into the reason that Jarrell as a painter is, I think is so compelling to me and so many of my colleagues at the BMA. Um, uh, one remarkable, a couple of remarkable things. One is for anybody attuned to the rhythms of the art world, you'll know the figuration over the course of the last maybe two years um, has truly ascended. And so one consequence of that ascent is a glut of figuration in the art world. So you can't really look anywhere without seeing a rendering of a likeness. And I think when you have that kind of preponderance of practice, you have to train your eye to look for those moments that are truly special within it. And I think this was the case with abstraction maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and a very similar process had to occur. You, it required a kind of closer looking, closer thinking than you would apply to the act of looking if there were less of it to look at. So um, in the case of Jarrell's work, he arrives at sort of exactly the right time and exactly the wrong time. <laughs> so, um, you know, Jarrell has been out of school for what, three years, some, I mean, graduated from Michael with an MFA in 2019. And that, uh, 2000, there, there, was, there was already a concentration, particularly of young African-American artists working with oil on canvas to produce likeness. And so within, and so much extraordinary work, and a lot of it being shown commercially and being purchased by museums. So within the context like that, I think to distinguish yourself truly autographically in three years, or like is an absolutely amazing experience. And when I say autographically, I mean, you know almost immediately if you're in the presence of a Joel Gibbs painting. And I would apply that to the three paintings or, or the two paintings in one sketch in our collection, as well as to um, any work of art that I might see by him in the broader context. So that autography within a broad range of various practices, I think is a pretty monumental achievement given the relative brevity of his career to date. Um, so that's the, that's the easy part to capture. And then there is the lineage of great portraiture. Um, so the Titians, the Rembrandts and the Velazquez's of the world. And I think many of them do use um, similar conceits. So those blank backgrounds that are intended to draw attention to the texture and fabric of the paint um, that then allows the character of the portrait to radiate from the surface. I think when you close your eyes and think about those great portraits, you don't think about any of those other details. There are no flags, you know, there are no pins. You think about the way that that figure radiates from the surface. And I think, um, you know, it has to do with that investment in deep feeling and the idea that paint is a really specific medium that isn't just charged with capturing a photographic lightness at all. It's, it's charged with capturing something that lives deep in the recesses of the subject and then finding a way to draw that character way out so it becomes a surface effect that you can then not just feel. And I think that that is what Jarrell does. And, um, and I know again, droning on, the way that he investigated um, the life and likenesses and passions, predilections, right-handed, left-handed of Elijah, he does a really similar thing um, with a lot of his other portraits. So one thing I've learned in conversation with him is that he'll paint the same thing over and over and over again. So you tend to find that repetition often with abstract painters where they're teaching themselves a certain kind of mark making so that it becomes really natural and they can do it almost without thinking. I find it really fascinating that Jarrell treats portraiture almost as abstraction, teaches himself likenesses so that when he's rendering a face, his hand almost knows what to do. He doesn't need to look at the source material anymore. He's doing it because he remembers. And I think it's that burrowing into the soul of the person through repetition that allows for those great portraits to emerge. So, you know, I could have just said it's a lot of hard work, um, <laughs> but I think that's a, that's a big part of it too. I think, you know, Jarrell's a relentless painter. He works really fast and he works constantly. 
And I think that's what, that's evident too in the quality of the practice. Well, speaking of great portraits, we've got the Obama portraits that are making its round uh, in museums across the country. I saw a friend who posted that she was, uh, it's in LA now, yeah. uh, and they went to go see it uh, last week. And so do you think that interest in the Obama portraits, uh, Amy Sherrill, shout out, Baltimore-based uh, artist now in New York area, but uh, certainly the uh, the portrait artist for Michelle Obama, uh, uh, do you think that their portraits actually help to stimulate interest in black portraiture? Oh, I mean, absolutely unquestionably. I think that, um, I think I was asked by, I'm not sure which publication, in the year of their unveiling, which I thought in the scheme of broader scheme of the art world, what was the most important thing that happened that year? And it was so self-evident to me. And I think the, the reason I felt so strongly that those two portraits were the most important event of that year um, is because we as a community, um, directors, curators, artists, collectors, art invested people suddenly saw, you know, our life's passion jump the rail all the way into the mainstream and begin to matter in an unprecedented way to a broader community of people. So I feel very strongly that whether it's being shown at the portrait gallery, LACMA or elsewhere, the people coming to see those likenesses are not the people that are coming to see our contemporary wing reinstallation, for instance. That so, so those portraits, I think, allowed us to traffic in a completely different sphere. And I will say that that was a big part of my draw towards this project too, mm -hmm. was to try and position an emerging Baltimore-based practitioner on that line between the museum world and the mainstream to make it evident that this should matter, that what we do should matter. Representation does matter. Indeed, I actually remember you saying we need to find the next Amy Sherald or think right. about as looking for the next Amy Sherald, um, again, a Baltimore-based artist who basically went big time after painting uh, Michelle Obama's portrait. But, you know, this basically takes me back to something. Uh, when I served on the board of the Baltimore Museum of Art and we were deciding to prioritize equity, I did a little bit of research and remember a presentation that you all had, a exhibit that you all had in, in the, uh, the museum about another time in history where black art and black portraits uh, were considered, you know, uh, you know, uh, something to be pursued and to, you know, a wide interest in the art world. And this was in the 1940s. Um, and certainly Baltimore had its own uh, flirtation with, uh, you know, elevating, uh, you know, artists of color at that time. Um, and then it went away. So Chris, I want you to tell us, you know, what's going on uh, with race, art, and valuation in the mainstream art world right now? Are we in another cyclical moment that'll go away? And, uh, you know, do you think that art appreciation and valuation uh, is tied to larger social and political phenomena? Can you give us a sense of what's going on? So I, I've always been of the mind, and I think this is the great appeal of working in a museum, that we are not we in, at times can guide society towards different moments of enlightenment based on the unique contributions of an artist. That's part of what we do. I also don't think that we're separate and apart as entities from broader societal forces. So it should come as no surprise that museums collecting and exhibition practices have exhibited exactly the same kind of race-based bias and gender-based bias that you see structuring history more broadly. So we're not exclusive to that history. We're simply a symptom of it. So that 1939 show that you are speaking of, Maya, I think is unbelievably interesting for a series of reasons. One is that it was the first exhibition in the major encyclopedic museum in this country to focus on the work of black artists. So, but the reason it came about is really fascinating. So in 1938, the museum issued a survey to the city of Baltimore asking people what they wanted to see. Um, and at that time, the resounding response was, we want to see black artists on display in the museum. So, the, and the, but the remarkable thing is the museum actually responded and did the exhibition. Now, just to be properly self-critical, when we looked back at our exhibition history and felt that there was an opportunity to recreate that show, we naturally thought that objects from that exhibition would have been purchased for the museum's permanent collection because that typifies our history as an institution. In fact, when we don't do that, we make great mistakes. Um, in that case, we found, of course, that nothing had been purchased from the exhibition, so we actually couldn't reconstitute it. So clearly there was, a, there was a call, there was a response, there was an action, but then the subsequent one that would allow us to memorialize that moment never took place. So then 
that you know in the intervening years, um, a focus on equity and collecting and exhibition making was not the first and foremost priority of this museum or any other museum in the country um, during those years. I think our feeling is that just as the Cone sisters changed the DNA of this institution when they gave their collection, we too, as a team of curators, um, and actually as, as trustees, as an artist community in Baltimore, want to do perform the same operation. I think we want to say much of the most important work being made in this country today is being made by Black American artists and other artists of color. It is, it is not only the equitable and right thing to do to collect that work, but if you're invested in excellence and relevance, it's the only thing you can do. And that's what the Cone sisters did. That's how they elevated our museum from being merely great to world-class with their gift. And I think that the task that we've set for ourselves is developing a collection for this institution that's centered in equity, that's centered in excellence, and that changes the DNA of the museum forever, just as they did. So that's the task that we're involved in. Um, I hope, I, and, I, and I believe that if we're determined and relentless in that, then we'll leave such an imprint on this museum and others on the broader art world that there will not be, there will be no going back. It will be impossible because we will have inscribed a new canon in the one that everybody thought they knew. Um, well, I stand in full support of that effort and I congratulate you for being a, a national and global leader in, in, this, in this space. Um, so you do think that we can basically have diverse artists be sustained over the long haul by basically being intense about it? That's, is, <laughs> or do you think that there's some rule changes in terms of how the art world goes about doing its business? Well, I don't know about the rule changes, but I do believe in the relentlessness of effort. And I do believe in um, the idea that we stand on, that this isn't simply, it isn't only an equity-based agenda. What we're engaged in here, I think, and this is going a little further in the argumentation, but is um, a process of reparation in consideration of a past rooted in bias that will eventually yield a future of equity. That's what I think, that, and that's what I hope. So um, the reason for this distortion in the present is a recognition of history's blind spots and biases with the promise of something true and fulsome and based in justice looking forward. And I think if, you know, if, if museums do that work in concert, and I still believe in the influence of museums, I really do, on the marketplace, on collectors, I believe wholeheartedly in the, in, in the work that we do in structuring culture, um, if we remain determined in that effort and begin to narrate for our publics true and just histories of art and that replicated across the country, I, do, I don't think there's any going back from that. And by the way, you did mention, I mean, we've been discussing race, but you did mention gender. Mm -hmm. And I think I saw a statistic that of all of the hundreds of thousands of, of works of art that you have, um, more than 90% of them, maybe even 95% of them are from male artists. Yeah, 96%. 96%. Uh, so, you know, we're not just talking about race here. We're talking about gender and representation. And I am going to come back to you, Jarrell, on this one because I read a fascinating interview that you did with Baltimore Magazine, where you said that basically you owe your success to women, black women um, who have supported you from birth to now. Uh, and, and that, uh, you know, that they have been your everything. I, I'd like for you to extrapolate that on that, but I'd also like to say that when I look at your body of work and I think of your work, I think of the male figure, not the female okay. figure. So can we be expecting a queen series from Jarrell Gibbs? Because I would love to see that. Yeah, that'll be coming um, when I get to it. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of my works now are centered around just like personal life experiences and me kind of unpacking, unpacking myself. Um, and that's not to say that that can't be represented by a woman, but I just haven't done it, to be completely honest. Um, yeah, I'm really, oh, man, women, Black women, my my family, my mother, my grandmothers, my aunts. I mean, to be completely honest, like that has they have been um, my foundation. You know, my my father was gone at such a young age, twenty seven. I was seven years old. 
Wow. You know, so that, that's a long time, you know, for me to just grow up centered around. I mean, my my family dynamic growing up was my mother and my two sisters, you know, and I was in the home. So, like, that's all I had. Um, my wife, I praise God for her, thankful. She's consistently there. Um, just being um, a voice of reason. Um, and this has been, like, throughout the duration of my, my life, you know, just women being there and being present and showing up at the right time to help me and to guide me in different ways, mature ways, you know? Um, I mean, even my gallerist, Marianne Ibrahim, you know, her coming in, stepping in, being a black woman and just championing me, you know, like right out of graduate school, you know? Everybody played a pivotal role in my life and continue to, you know, and you as well, you know, like this is a monumental time. This is a monumental moment. And you are a part of this as well as a black woman. So I'm just grateful. I'm thankful to have you all in my corner. And um, thank you. <laughs> so I got to tell you that Jeffrey Kent, uh, who is a, a, a gallerist himself here in Baltimore, um, who, and who seems to be, and I'm following, by the way, all of the BBAs, I call you all BBAs because of Jeffrey Kent. Um, I once said, oh, the local artist. And he said, ah, don't call local call them Baltimore based. <laughs> now we got the BBAs out there and then there are the four BAs, you know, the, the Baltimore based black brother artists. <laughs> and you all seem to like move as a tribe if they're talking about Chris Wilson or Will Watson or Ernest Shaw or, and, you know, of course there's Monica Kegbu and, um, you know, so, you know, how does it feel at this moment to be a part of a community, a community of Baltimore based artists who are trying to do big things on a national and global scale? It's amazing. And we're actually doing it. You know, we're finally doing it. It's beyond trying at this point. We're actually conquering and I'm grateful. Um, it's good to be able to celebrate this with people that you've invested time and energy to and we all can collectively grow together. Um, but it also speaks to Baltimore and how we operate. Um, and that was a list, but it, we have a lot more, you know, of like incredible artists here in the city. Um, but we all collectively stick together and champion each other. And um, what I can say and what I really appreciate about the community that I've built here in Baltimore um, as it relates to like the art space and just networking and growing over time is our ability to put our own self-interest aside and make the best decision for everybody else. You know, like that's what I really love. That's what I really enjoy. And um, just constantly supporting each other in any way that we possibly can. Uh, I don't. I can't, I can't speak on other places. I can't speak on other states and other countries and what happens. In, but I know here in Baltimore, we rocking together. We're traveling together. We're going to shows together. We, we're pulling up on other people's shows. We're um, we having writers. Like I had Watkins contribute to my, my catalog that I just, you know, that just was released through the gallery. Like we're doing everything in unit, you know, as a, as a, a team, as a body. And we're, we're stronger because of that. So I, I think that's phenomenal. And everybody giving everybody else that, that it's not about competition. It's about everybody working together to uplift so that everybody can make it. It's not a narrow needle. It's, you know, a broad bridge. And that is phenomenal. So Darrell, my last question for you, and you know, it might be too early for me to ask it, but what do you want your legacy to be when you think about that now? Oh, man. Um, it goes back to just who I am. I, I wanted to be, I want my legacy to be, you know, he was a God fearing man. He was a father. He was a husband that was committed to those things, um, committed to family, um, committed to being the best that I can be at my craft and um, just a human, you know, living, learning, making mistakes, growing for those, from those mistakes. And, um, just really, just real, you know, like that's what I really want more than anything. Um, nothing more. Well, I think that that is a fabulous legacy and I'm gonna need somebody from the Baltimore Museum of Art team to actually tell me what the questions are. If we have some, I actually don't actually see my document, so. Oh, very good. I, I, we, have a, we have a few, we don't have very long left, but um, I will attempt to, to read uh, the most interesting we can get through as many as possible. Um, and of course, if anybody has a question, you can use the chat feature too. So the first one, I think this, this comes from Facebook. 
and it's clearly for Jarrell. Um, and it says, will prints of the painting be made? No. <laughs> why, do you, why do you explain why? Because I think the explanation is quite interesting. Yeah, um, I'm not interested in prints. Um, and there's nothing against, against prints. It's my type of work, the way that I create paintings, you have to experience them in person. And to make a print of a painting of mine wouldn't do it any of this. Um, it would take away from uh, what I am attempting for the viewer to receive. So I, I'm just not into prints. The reason I'm why, why I'm laughing is because I actually proposed that at one point in the process and I was rebuffed and I didn't ask, you know, well, actually I might have asked, but I didn't get an answer. Oh, actually, I think I took myself out of the, uh, the equation before I got an answer. But basically, you've now just answered me. Uh, thank you, Jarrell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another, and this is actually a fabulous question. Could you explain the title of the portrait and the pin on the congressman's lapel? Yes, um, the pin is actually the same lapel from uh, the photograph that was taken of the Alana, uh, Honorable Elijah Cummings um, for the cover of his book. Um, and as far as, uh, what was the first question? I'm sorry. Uh, the title of the portrait. Yes, yes, the title. The title came from um, uh, the Honorable Elijah Cummings. I think it was his inauguration, and he uh, had a poem that he had recited. I'm sorry, the name of the artist, of the poet that did the poem is slipping me right now. But in that poem was that specific line, and it really resonated with me because it resonated with him. And he was explaining how that line was a part of every thing and every fiber and every decision that he made, which also made me think about Baltimore and how Baltimore is a part of every decision, every fiber and everything that I do as well. So it, it really resonated with me. Yeah, let me just say this. Um, you know, Elijah always said that poem and, and he lived by it. He knew that he had a life-threatening disease for more than 25 years. And so he knew every day of his life, every minute was precious and he treated it like that. He was a man on a mission. And that poem was the theme that basically undergirded his life. So it just so happens that he had been citing it uh, for a very long time. And it was the first house floor. It was the first, um, uh, he, he basically said it in his first House floor speech. When he got elected to Congress. And as far as the pen is concerned, um, all of the members of Congress every um, term are issued a unique member's pen. Uh, it allows them to walk fluidly throughout the entire Capitol complex uh, without being stopped necessarily by police. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a member's pen uh, and it usually has an eagle on it. Uh, and every term it's a different color or different style. Thank you, Maya. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. So this is great too, because it, I think it relates very directly to an attribute that many of us associate with the Congressman. Um, so I think there is a specificity in regards to the way that the Cummings hands and the gavel are painted. Jarrell, could you elaborate a little bit on the treatment of the hands? Yes. Um, the uh, reason I was, so, so the way that I painted the hands and the gavel uh, is, is kind of similar. Um, I was really interested in, again, this is, you have to see these, you have to see this painting in person. When you get up to the paint and you get close to it, you're able to see the way that the paint was applied to the canvas to make the fingers and to make the gavel as if it's in the process of moving, just finished moving or about to. So it was, it was about creating energy without actually making the hand move or making the gavel move. So they kind of painted and you know, they, they kind of paint and work together in the way that they were created, the way that they were uh, put on the canvas. But the idea behind it was to create energy in the way that the paint strokes are put on the, uh, on the canvas. Brilliant, very interesting. Last one, here we go. Chris says, well, here we go. Chris has so compellingly shared what museums need to do and how the BMA has led the way. But the question for Jarrell, what other changes would you like to see happen for paths to continue to open for you and other artists who have been historically marginalized? Fabulous question. Indeed. Um, 
I would say um, what I would really like to see is, you know what? I would like to see more critiques, to be completely honest. I would like to see museums open up the space to other artists that are in the community, in their particular community, and have artists come uh, to visit, to guest speak, to talk about works and elaborate on what they see in work. So we as a unit, we as artists, we as painters, we as creators are kind of working together, taking what makes something good and, and, and enable to apply it to our work in a way that's true to us so that we can continue to grow as creators and have longevity. Um, I, I think it's very important for us to learn from each other, share each other's ideas and, and, and again, grow together. Very well stated. Um, I think Maya, we are out of time, unfortunately. Okay. Well, I just wanna say thank you, uh, certainly to the Baltimore Museum of Art, to Jarrell Gibbs and the other artists who contributed to this process. Congratulations, Jarrell. To all of the donors who supported this, to the selection committee, to all of the people who have come through and will come through the Baltimore Museum of Art to see the portrait in person. We just wanna say thank you, but I just wanna give a special, special shout out to Elijah Cummings because Elijah loved Baltimore as much as he loved life itself. And the people of Baltimore poured into Elijah and made him who he was and he knew it and he carried that knowledge with him every single day. And it was reflected in his love of Baltimore, but it was also reflected in his support for youth. He firmly believed that just as he was elevated and supported in his childhood and through his, throughout his youth, that he had and we have to do the same thing for the youth of Baltimore today. And so this process is reflective of Elijah's wish and passion, just like his creation of the Elijah Cummings uh, youth program. Uh, you know, um, all of the, uh, the, the young people with potential in the city, whether it's arts or other things, need to be supported. So we just encourage you to come out and see the portrait, but also to give back to the community and support our youth. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you so much, Darrell. <laughs>